Welcome to the Institute for New Economic Thinking Forum on the future of work, what's at stake. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor-at-large of The Hill and a longtime supporter of INET. We have a really great uh, couple of panelists today. We have Nobel laureate and William R. Berkeley Professor of Economics and Business at the Stern School of Business at NYU. Joining us from Milan, Michael Spence. We also have uh, director and chairman of the board of the McKinsey Global Institute, James Manika. Uh, joining us. You know, I thought I want to tell everybody the format today is going to be a little bit different. Um, there's a great movie in the past called My Dinner with Andre with William Sean and Andre Gregory, where uh, two people sat down for dinner and really over three hours uh, couldn't stop. Uh, so I'm, I've got two incredible interlocutors uh, who are going to go in, and I'm going to jump in when I can. We did a prep call the other day, and it was, I, I wish we'd had the video going. We could have turned it into a great movie. Uh, it was so wonderful. But let me just open uh, with one provocation for the two of them to start, which is in 19, uh, or I'm sorry, in 2016, it was the 90th anniversary of McKinsey. McKinsey put out a report on the way in which technology uh, the coming era of AI, all of the technological revolutions we see coming was going to be incredibly disruptive uh, in the American economy. And I ask at that point whether there would be uh, net job increase, net job decrease, what the social impacts of that would be, what kinds of impacts would it be across uh, the board. And I want to start with that question because I, we're not only going to be looking at technology today, we're going to be looking at the broad questions, the social questions, the impact questions, questions about COVID. Uh, and so let me just start with James and Michael and ask, have we figured out where this coming age of technology is going to leave society uh, as employed as it is today with, with less dysfunction uh, and thus problem solving? Or are we going to see greater employment problems, greater inequality uh, from what's coming ahead? James? Well, th thank you, Steve, and wonderful to do this with you and with Michael. This is going to be fun. Uh, but let me describe you know, a little bit what the work you were talking about. What we did at the time and we've continued to do is to, first of all, try to understand what exactly, what exactly is the AI is technology and what what will it mean and what are the actual developments whether it's in natural language processing whether it's in robotics machine vision all the different characters of these ai technologies so we try to understand what they were and where we were we then also try to understand what this looks like and how this maps into the activities and tasks that people do so we started with a fun in a bottoms up mapping of the activities and tasks to understand how this all intersected and then try to then get a sense of what does this mean for work. And we, in the case of the U.S. context, we looked at the roughly 800 plus occupations that the Bureau of Labor Statistics looks at to really understand what the impact would be. So let me tell you where we ended up, and we've continued to refine this. And I would summarize it as kind of jobs, jobs gained, jobs lost, and jobs changed. What I mean by that is we actually found that, in fact, there will be jobs that will be created. Uh, we know that whenever we've had these technological breakthroughs and innovations, uh, they tend to spur productivity growth, which also then leads to job growth. So there will be jobs gained. There will also be jobs lost, because we know that some of these occupations have many of their constituent activities that can be automated. And so therefore, if you have an occupation where a lot of its constituent activities can be automated, we'll start to see declines in those jobs. And mm -hmm. then we also have jobs changed. And this is actually more impo quite important because the jobs changed reflects the fact that many of these technologies automate aspects or particular tasks that each of us do. And so you see these jobs where a, portion, a good example of this, uh, Steve, is to think about the bank teller as a good historical example. If you remember, you know, if you had looked in 1970, what the bank teller did was mostly count your money, either to take it from you or to give it back to you. Uh, and then maybe if they had a little bit of time left over, they'd do something else. But today, that bank teller still exists. They spend much, much, much less time counting your money uh, and take either to take it from you or to give it to you because the ATM does that. But the bank teller now does other things. This is an example of jobs changed. So when you put all this together uh, to come back to your original question, our view is that at least for the next few decades, there'll be more jobs created than jobs lost and many more jobs changed. So we don't worry about 
a jobless future, at least not in the next several decades anyway, uh, at all. But think about how do we manage the transitions as we see some jobs lost, some jobs gained, and some jobs changed. So the question of transitions becomes a fundamental thing. And let me say one more quick thing on the, what transitions I'm talking about. They're fundamentally about three or four transitions. One is the transition in terms of the skills needed to do work. So the t conversation about reskilling, re-education, lifelong learning becomes quite real because we're going to have to keep up and adapt to the educational skill needs that are going to be required. That's the first transition. We're going to need to do that in a big way. The second transition is to how we help people transition from declining occupations to growing occupations. Uh, and that's an important occupational set of transitions. Then the other question we're going to need to think about is the impact on wages. Because all of these things, even when we have a, a future with jobs, the, make, the impact on wages is quite real because right. we know that many of the jobs that are declining have tended to be some of the ones that pay well, and many of the ones that are growing have tended to be some of the ones that don't pay as well. Uh, that's, you know, so the, the impact on the wage picture is an important one that we should discuss at some point today. So these are some of the important transitions we're going to have to think about in the context of work. Michael, can you can you jump in here and, and, and give us a sense of what your dashboard looks like of the factors when it comes to technological change, jobs, and, you know, what, what are the headlines of that that we should be aware of? Well, uh, you know, I think James has kind of laid out the kind of framework. So uh, there, there is a subset of people who think that we, you know, we should worry about joblessness. But I think the majority view now, based on a lot of work, is that um, the I think of the challenges as essentially twofold. One, one is that um, you know it's well documented across virtually all the developed countries. Uh, meaning Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand, that what David Autor calls job and income polarization is real. It, it's, and the, what it means is that middle, what is the last thing James said, middle income jobs are vanishing, uh, and uh, in, including a number of them that are routine and then highly uh, vulnerable to automation. And then the question is, well, see if we're still relatively fully employed, outside of the pandemic economy, you know, where are the jobs reappearing? And, and the answer is they're reappearing in jobs that aren't being automated at both the upper and lower end of the spectrum, right? Now, what you'd like to see <laughs> is, you know, modulo the fact that, you know, everybody can't be above average, is, is more of them appear at the upper end. But I'm afraid the data show that at least at the start of this set of transitions James talked about, at least, and, and in a fair number of countries, the, the reverse is happening. So the jobs are appearing at the lower end in larger numbers. Uh, and as the middle gets, quote, hollowed out, to use the, the term of art in the, in the, in the media. Um, and that means basically that there's middle income people who've lost those jobs and are now doing jobs that pay a lot less. And there's unhappiness and, uh, and so on associated with that. Now, whether this is part of a transition that you know gets much less difficult once we deal effectively, if we can, with a reskilling of our workforce, right? So you get a short run effect, and then you get a longer run effect that James and I spend a lot of time talking about. But I think there's at least some reasonable hope that a concerted sort of multi-institutional, and by that I mean collaboration between education, government, and business, to take this seriously as part of their, you know, sort of overall policy agenda or, or strategy in the case of business, is, there's a reasonable hope that, we'll, that this will be ameliorated to some extent. And, and I guess this is, falls in the category of, you know, well, does anybody really know with great precision where we're going to end up? The answer, I think, the honest answer at this point is no. I mean, to the both, of, both of you, how is the pandemic changed your assessment of what's going on? What trends has it uh, made very clear and stark? Michael? Well, well, let, me, well yeah, let, me, let me take a shot at that, because um, I just wrote something on this. We have known for some time, 
and I'm going to ask James to, to jump in on this. We've known for some time that at least when you look at the public stock markets, that an increasing fraction of the incremental value creation is associated with intangible assets. And a, and a significant fraction of those intangible assets are, um, are uh, basically digitally related. Not all of them, but, but a lot of them. Uh, and so, and we know those, those intangible assets are being created by relatively small numbers of people in relation to the size of the population, right? So what, you, what you've got is a situation in which the incremental value creation, which in principle at some point we've all got to share, I mean, that's kind of, you know, what economies do, <clears throat> is being created by a small number of people. The asset, the intangible assets, are owned by a relatively concentrated set of people, including the people who create them. Uh, and what you see is a pattern of employment and trying to traditional value creation with a combination of tangible assets, meaning bricks and mortar and stuff like that, and labor. Those are diverging. And what and the straight answer to your question is this became dramatically obvious in the pandemic economy because the, di the, intent, the digitally enabled intangible assets accelerated in terms of importance and value creation, and the other ones got hammered. And so what mm -hmm. was sort of partly visible before became just dramatically, you know, just flashes on the screen. All you've got to do is compare Amazon, you know, or Google or Alibaba and the airline stocks, right? <laughs> and, and, and it may just to take an example, a final comment on this, because we've talked a lot about this, and James has some important insights based on their research on, on what's happening in inside industries and sectors. Um, but I looked at the, the, play, the, the, the a little study done at the University of Chicago, um, and the question was, what fraction of work can be done from home? And the answer for the American economy was roughly a third. And then they looked at it by geography and sector. And by sector, you know, you get, you get a, a version of what I just said. So the absolute, the, the, you know, if you look at the tech sectors, the answer is like 87 or 90 percent, right? Similarly in finance, if you if you look at the hospitality sector, you know, uh, the answer is four percent. So the the other 96 percent are have been unemployed or furloughed because because of the pandemic economy, and they're not working from home, and they're being helped by by government programs and so on like that. So as I say, the pandemic economy, you know, threw into sharp focus something that that we knew was going on before, but it's more extreme and it has made the pandemic economy a big negative shock with respect to distribution. Thank you, yeah, James. If, if I, yeah, if, if I could just add to what Mike uh, just described uh, in of the what the pandemic economy has shown us. So, for example. Uh, Mike's exactly right that we talk as if everybody can work from home. It's really only a third who can. Uh, other people actually have to show up someplace, uh, which is two thirds of everybody else. If you look at, you know, any, you know, whether it's in Europe or the United States, and let me take United States as an example, uh, something like about 38% um, or so of workers are vulnerable, and vulnerable in the following sense, vulnerable either to being laid off uh, in this COVID moment, or furloughed, or see reduced work hours or reduced wages. That's uh, that's a much larger proportion than what we're seeing as uh, counted as unemployed. If you look at that third, it, it, its profile is interesting. Eighty percent of them in the U.S. Uh, earn less than forty thousand dollars a year. So these are predominantly low wage workers. Eighty percent of them. Uh, Close to, again, 80% of them have no college degrees. A disproportionate uh, share of them are black and brown people. Uh, and, you know, majority of them work in the sectors that Mike was talking about. Uh, so retail, hospitality, and in those sectors, as Mike said, it's a tiny proportion who can work uh, from home. So you see the kind of almost, you know, regressive disproportionate impacts that COVID is highlighting. The other thing we should also keep in mind, which is something we've seen in our research, both looking at you know, Europe and the US in particular, is the incredible change in the geography of work. Uh, and this is quite interesting, because in the case of the United States, we actually went through 
and Steve, you'll find this funny. I, you know, I now know how many counties there are in America. I think it's something like 3,149, I think, um, <laughs> is the number. And in Europe, we looked at these kind of uh, small regions, uh, 1,100 micro regions. And what you see is that uh, even when the economy, even before COVID, even when we were saying jobs had recovered, they were very concentrated in a few places, actually, mm. um, uh, in a few part, you know, roughly in a third of the country is where most of the job growth was. And some of these were cities, some of them were kind of growth hubs of one form or another. Everywhere else, not really. So you're starting to see an, increase, an interesting kind of geography of work. The other thing you see about the geography of work comes back from what Mike was alluding to, which is call it the superstar effect. So we've actually looked at this in the context of the superstar firms or superstar sectors and even superstar cities. And you find what that all of that work shows you that there's a relative concentration of a few places, whether they're companies or sectors or cities, that are generating a huge amount of the economic surplus at, at the expense of everybody else. It's you know, people forget that in the United States, one percent of counties essentially generate close to a third of the country's GDP. That's 31 counties generating a third of the U.S. GDP. So these geographic effects are also quite real and quite, quite important. Yeah. Are any, are any of these impacts that the two of you are seeing and talking about, you know, is there any sort of creative destruction moment in here where some of the uh, inequality that we've seen, some of the disproportionate impact, as, as you, you were talking about, say, on communities of color, we've seen, you know, you know racial division, uh, uh, economic division. Is there any, I mean, I hate to sound naive, but is there any unseen opportunity to leap for, leapfrog out of some of those uh, uh, tense inequalities into something different? Well, I, I think there could be. Uh, and I emphasize there could be. I think if we if we really rethought how the economy works in terms of the you know uh, how, you know could we think about intangibles differently? And Mike alluded to this and he's done some fabulous work on this. Could we think about how people participate in the economy? I think you know we've you know historically the way the majority of people participate in the economy is through their labor, primarily, mm. and in a world in which you know the marginal contribution of labor or the sh labor share of the economy declines, that will obviously keep squeezing the proportion that labor gets. But if there are other mechanisms of participation that are, you know, additive to labor, then it gets interesting. Then you start to think about, you know, do we think about, you know, in, in endowments differently? Do we think about mechanism participation do we give everybody make every mm. stock owner do we make people and you know co-owners of things how do we think about different modes of participation in the economy that could start to change things michael yeah i agree with that uh and, and i think it's urgent um you know i I've, I've come to the conclusion relatively recently that while we have to take seriously this uh the set of transitions james described earlier um, in the in the context of work, um, that we have now reached a point in the way our society is configured, in terms of the ownership of assets and so on, that it's going to be very difficult, you know, to sort of round the corner and head off in a different direction. I mean, you know, we, it takes investment to kind of make these transitions, and the way we're configured now is that a small fraction of people own the the assets that are gaining in value. Many people, as, as the MGI and McKinsey Global Institute and others research shows are, you know, having struggling to invest in a house uh, because of biases in the application process, you know, have relatively simple looking balance sheets where because of monetary policy and other things, they can earn next to nothing as a return on their assets. We have, you know, the way the economy works, you know, the the places where the people who are making the most money and whose assets are building up, you know, pay a lot for housing and other people can't live there. So we've sort of semi-segregated mm. ourselves without actually having policies that relate to that. That that affects the, it's very hard to be precise about this, but the network structure of an economy, including the interpersonal networks, not just digital mm -hmm. ones, really matter. You know, who you know, 
what contacts you have and other things. So, so you know, right now, I, to be honest with you, Steve, and, and, and again, James and I have talked about this, I'd love to be optimistic, and there are certain areas that I'd like to talk about mm -hmm. in a minute where, where I am optimistic, but, but overall, I think we've got a, a monumental task ahead of us. Where are you yeah, optimistic? I mean, oh, go ahead, James. No, yeah, if, if, ahead, if I could jump in, because, um, Steve, we're going to get optimistic here shortly, but let me just uh, uh, <laughs> add to what Michael's describing and uh, yeah. paint a fuller picture of, of, of what it looks like. One of the things that's quite fascinating in the 21st century, because we now have 20 years of the 21st century or close enough, uh, is, you know, is what's happened to what you might call the social contract. So what do I mean by that? I mean, the social contract is a big philosophical topic and all of that. But if, if you look at at least the economic aspects of that, which is where you think about how people interact in the world, in the economy, either as workers, as consumers, and as savers, if you like, because in some ways that's, that those are some of the more direct economic ways in which we interact with the economy. As workers, uh, it's, it's actually a mixed story. The good news, just to be a little positive uh, here, the good news is that, you know, we've actually created, you know, an unprecedented number of jobs since 2000 everywhere. Uh, so that's the good news. So we've actually created lots of jobs. The tough news on the jobs front is that uh, there's, we've had this income polarization that Mike talked about uh, from some of his work and David Otter's work. But we've also made work a little bit more fragile uh, in mm -hmm. the sense that most of the jobs that we've created in the last 20 years are of an alternative variety. So either contingent work or fissured work or part-time work. So it's been a mixed story, but job growth, uh, but income polarization. If you look at it from the point of view of people as consumers and households who are, how, who are purchasing things, again, it's a story of two worlds. One is if you look at the... Uh, products we buy, such as cell phones, smart TVs, white goods products, the highly tradable commodities, if you like, that are globally competed and traded, they've become much, much, much cheaper. Uh, and the amount of consumer surplus that we've created in these highly competed, globally traded products is phenomenal. It's been a wonderful thing. If you, if you plotted a chart, you'd see the price declines have been off the charts. However, some of the other basics, like uh, housing, education, healthcare, and depending on where you live, transportation, those have actually grown, become more expensive mm -hmm. in a way that it's actually outstripped um, in a many household income. So if you look at, for example, middle and especially low income households, the share of their budgets that are now consumed by the cost of housing, healthcare, and education, well, healthcare depends on the, what country you're in, uh, has grown. So you suddenly find that, right. you know, and this hasn't kept up with the wage, what's happened on the wage front. So that's, that's created a set of challenges. Then you look at people as savers. Uh, and the picture on savers is because the incomes have been polarized, many people haven't saved. We've also seen institutional arrangements for saving, whether it's pensions and others, also pull back. So people are having to rely, you know, do more themselves at a time when they can't afford to do more themselves to save. In fact, the rough numbers on this one, Steve, is that, mm. you know, most people in the advanced economies, and we've looked at this at uh, the roughly 20-something OECD countries to look at this picture, most people have enough savings, either themselves or the pension funds, et cetera, to cover 10 years, when, in fact, most people are going to be in retirement for double that. So... Mm. So this social contract looks very, very challenged, and it's affected, again, middle-income households the most, as Mike sort of pointed out, but also low-income households in particular. And this is a real challenge. So, Well, James, I, I want to thank you. Yeah. yeah, James, I want to thank you for making it even more bleak uh, to give. You know, I, I was excited when Mike, you know, mentioned that he was optimistic about anything. It's, it, it gave me a perk up. Um, but as, as James, as Mike responds and shares with us what he is optimistic about and sees opportunities around, I just want to ask you whether, whether you know, like Andrew Yang was out there talking about a universal basic income or some model of that when you talk about transportation and housing and healthcare, whether America in particular, I know we're talking about the world, whether America in particular needs to rethink some of the packaging of those 
uh, uh, common goods and, 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 and just realities of life for people um, when you've got so much wealth, uh, you know, stacked up on an end and, you know, so much uh, stress and fragility, as James just said on the other, does that need to be rethought? But let's go to the optimism first, but maybe uh, Michael can, can um, reference my obsession with universal basic income as well. Well, no, no, let me respond to that. I think we have to think about these things. I mean, people are thinking about universal basic income um, and things that are like it and, you know, having a reasonably sensible debate about the pros and cons. Um, uh, you, people properly point out that we want, you know, some version of decent work, meaning rewarding, uh, that isn't really captured by that. Uh, so that's another dimension. Um, I live in Europe, you know, so one of the strengths in Europe is, that, you know, I, I know, I'm not saying this place is perfect or they put together economically or in other ways, but but the social services and social safety nets are more elaborate. Uh, and so education is less expensive. Uh, you know, health is less expensive. I mean, these are, you know, if you go down the list of things that James just, you know, mentioned, on the uh, on the consumption side, especially the ones that have gone up sort of astronomically in terms of cost for, to the consumer, um, you know that's a that's a, a big deal part of the problem. And and there's even a you know some version of a less well developed discussion of this, which I think is really important. Which is, you know, we can't get out of this in my view if 10% of the population owns some en enormous fraction of the assets, including the really valuable ones. You know, so, so at somewhere along the line, in addition to dealing with income, I think we have to deal with the opportunities to participate in the as investors, as savers and investors in the in the prosperity of the economy overall. Now, that's a, mm. you know, if anybody waited out on stage and said, I know how to do that, you know, they probably would be accused of lack of humility. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that, you know, creative minds with the right, the right values can't address it. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just l let me say briefly, um, you know, my background in economics as an applied economic theorist was studying informational gaps and, uh, mm. and asymmetries in markets. And they, these are all over the place. Um, they're also all over the place now in economics, thanks to a lot of work by a lot of talented people. Um, but the thing that fascinates me is in the area of creating markets and uh, uh, and you know financial services and other things, the the digital economy is closing these gaps. Um, so, I've been participating with some folks in China who've been studying this um, in Hangzhou. They're related to Alibaba and Am Financial, so they have a fair amount of data on in that part of the world at their disposal, mm. and it's pretty clear. Um, that what's going on is that um, people who are anonymous and unserved and for whom there are no markets for things like credit in the in the digital era become identifiable. I mean, in, in the language mm -hmm. we used to use, Steve, the, the digital economy and data um, properly, properly and responsibly managed is creating new screening and signaling mechanisms that enable markets to come into existence. The the so-called adverse selection problem that, that, that George Akerlof mm -hmm. so colorfully described is, is it's not being crushed, but it's being reduced mm -hmm. in terms of impact very substantially. And what I like about this is I don't know, I guess nobody knows, you know, whether this is going to, uh, you know, raise the kind of top line growth figure, but it's certainly going to increase the inclusiveness of the economy. And I think these, this, this kind of, um, responsible application of, uh, of digital technology is, is actually has lessons for all of us. I mean, we have underserved communities who, are, who struggle to deal with the existing institutions and vice versa. Um, I'll just finish with an example, so just so it's clear what I mean. There's, a, there's an entity that was created two or three years ago called MyBank, and its purpose is to uh, bring into the economy in terms of access to financial services, especially credit, um, very small businesses in the Chinese economy. These are businesses that um, have five or fewer employees. Um, they have no, n absent the digital world, they have no track record. They have no collateral that's worth anything. 
and they're so small mm -hmm. it isn't worth it for a bank operating by its traditional style to deal with them. Um, and so they just get left out or they borrow from friends and family and we get, you know, some kind of relatively poor substitute for a, a really inclusive pattern. And they can serve them now and they can serve them properly. They can extend credit. They don't have high default rates um, and they price the price the credit um, properly. So um, what, what, I, what I'm, I guess, trying to push here is, you know, a little creative thinking on our own underserved communities and, and thinking carefully about the applications of, of digital technology to try to increase what I see, reduce anonymity and increase access. I mean, yeah, I should let, just let, say, let just in reaction uh, before James jumped in, that, you know, this is one of the things I found fascinating where PayPal created an entire line of new business by using kind of local reputational research, not based on traditional criteria, looking at communities, and began, uh, when you kind of look at the small business loan um, lower threshold at large banks, it's still very high. And so lots of people were behind that. So PayPal, I'm Dan Schulman, the CEO, has, has developed this very different business model um, that's pumping finance in at that at that level, just along the lines that you shared, Michael. I'm sorry, James, um, and I want to tell everyone, by the way, please uh, share your questions on the Q and A panel, the Q and A link. Uh, we're going to be um, going to questions in in just a bit, and would love to have your questions for both of our superstar guests, uh, James. Yeah, no, I was going to uh, add to what Michael and you are both describing, which is, I think. We, you know, one of the most exciting things is this arena of what you might digital financial inclusion. And, mm -hmm. and part of that is fintech, part of that is e-commerce. But in digital financial inclusion, we should also include even things like people being able to establish who they are. One of the things that's quite fascinating in, in, in developing countries, especially in India, has had an interesting experiment, very large scale experiment on this, is that the number of people who can actually establish where they live and who they are uh, absent digital technologies is actually not that large. But, you know, they've tried to scale that up mm. by expanding with digital identifications and other mechanisms. Now, all of a sudden, not only can I participate in banking and fintech in the ways that you're both describing and get access to loans mm. and so forth, but I can also establish who I am. I can get a job. I can also establish uh, other kinds of uh, uh, property rights and other things. So the the scope and scale of digital financial inclusion in the developing world, but also, quite frankly, even in advanced economies, is actually very, very large. This is pretty exciting. And, you know, I'm glad that, you know, Michael point, pointed this out around, you know, the role that this plays around information signaling. This is, this is a game-changing inclusion, inclusion uh, kind of mechanism. You know, I was talking to... Uh, for example, uh, one of my friends runs uh, a mobile company, uh, a very large mobile company in Africa. One of the things that they've been able to do, for example, is to dramatically lower the, the threshold for cash transfers you can do to, you know, pennies or the amount of levels you need to be able to have to establish what is essentially a bank account uh, is far, 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 far lower than what a traditional banking system can do. This is game changing. Uh, but I, I should comment on your UBI mm -hmm. point, by the way. Uh, we just wrote a little paper looking at um, how, you know, Finland has is is just run the most, the most well instrumented experiment over the last two years, by the way, on UBI. Mm -hmm. And the results are fascinating. Uh, among them, the fact that it didn't reduce people's appetite to work. In fact, that it actually increased it mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. it, it created all kinds of flexibility. The reason why this is important, and you know, Steve, you may know this, but I'm currently co-chairing California's Future Work Commission that the governor mm. of California set up. And one of the things we've now realized in this COVID moment is that the, the nature of safety nets uh, really matters. Because if you've got safety nets, uh, the health safety nets or uh, income safety nets that are tied to employers, guess what happens when those employers shut down? Mm. Right. And guess what happens? So we're going to have to really think hard about how do we reimagine safety nets? Now, this isn't to say UBI is a silver bullet to answer to this question, but we're going to have to get interestingly creative about what is the nature of safety nets in the 21st century? 
I, I think it's so important. And James, you know, I was involved with the very early days of New America, and you know, being trying to find ways to smartly decouple benefits and and have benefits, you know, you know, arm people, give them toolkits to navigate and surf a turbulent economy. But it seemed like you know, workers and employees were you know, the most handicapped uh, of all the other factors out there. Let me just ask you, you know, a kind of large meta question before we go to um, our audience. And, you know, uh, we are talking a bit about technology. So as we talk about 5G, which is really a holding place for thinking about quantum computing and AI and Internet of Things, you know, big data, all of these elements come together. Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, wrote a book called Tools and Weapons uh, and said that these new technologies, particularly AI and what it can do in you know, facial recognition software and all the other dimensions, they can be very helpful tools to society or they can be nightmares of a 1984 or well, you know, George Orwellian uh, uh, type uh, security state in the future. And so I'm just wondering, you know, both of you have so many insights into the economic dimensions of this, but part of what we're talking about coming at us, whether, you know, I asked Eric Schmidt once, how will AI seduce the American public to love it? And he said, better health outcomes and diagnoses and decreasing fraud. But if those same you know, elements that will help people in one way or another also kind of imprison them, restrict them, restrict their freedoms, cause other large externality problems, I'm just interested in your insights on those dimensions of technology and society, because we've got to think about that. Uh, do you have thoughts on that, Michael? Uh, yeah, I think we both do. Um, so I guess the way I would frame it, Eric Schmidt once said, you know, we're entering an era, he's talking about AI, where your cell phone is going to know what you're going to do before you do. Uh, and that's a little scary. <laughs> but, um, I, I think the, 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 the challenge here is the responsible use of data, right? I mean, I, they, for example, in the pandemic economy, we've made you know an inadequate use of di digital data that would have helped us, right? We're all walking around, we're equally dangerous to each other. The Asian economies have done better at that. Why is that? Well, it, part of the reason is we have different you know values with respect to sort of privacy and other things. And the other problem we have is that we don't trust any enough institutions to handle our data responsibly. So, so I think there's a big challenge here. Most of the benefits that we're talking about, that I was talking about before, are unachievable if you um, are put in a situation where basically people don't trust the people who have the data, right? Uh, and, and these trust issues, you know, don't get talked about enough. Every single e-commerce platform has a payment system that they had to create. And, and right. you know why they created it? Not because they wanted some high-tech digital, you know, mobile payment system. They they created it because the buyers didn't trust the sellers and vice versa. There's a <laughs> the buyer didn't think he was going to get the product, and the seller didn't think he was going to get the money. And this was true in Latin America, at Mercado Libre, and they created Mercado Power. And it's exactly the origin of Alipay. Now, you know, a high-tech sort of, you know, marvel out there in the world. And but these issues are fundamental. And now the issue that we have to face if we're gonna take advantage of all of these things that are possible is we have to have both trust and governance systems that give people confidence that the, their data will be managed, whatever the differences in values across countries and societies, and there are differences, right? right? Whatever those differences are, they are, those values are respected in the way that data is managed. Mm -hmm. James, over to you. Yeah, I think I think uh, I agree. I think the um, getting the governance right really, really matters because one of the things that's fascinating about this class of technology, Steve, is you might call them dual use technologies if you want to use that language. Mm -hmm. Which is um, there's a class, a whole class of them: communication technologies, whether it's five G and so forth, artificial intelligence. You could even add biotech to that. There's a, so there's a whole class of these technologies where the innovation, economic, and even societal benefits are huge, huge. But at the same time, they could be misused. Uh, and misuse here, and by the way, on, on the misuse side of these technologies, we shouldn't just focus on governments. We've also got criminal elements to that. We can also have 
other activists or disruptors of this of any kind or scale. So the the actors on the misuse side are quite wide. And by mm -hmm. the way, you know, and you know, look at what we're seeing with deep fakes um, using AI technology and what's possible with that. So I think we have to solve for these governance uh, mechanism uh, mechanisms that create trust and get and and that's one of the I think one of the global challenges of the next few decades is in fact how do we build governance mechanisms to allow us to fully capture the benefit and economic value and societal value of these technologies while at the same time building trust systems. I think one of the things that makes this difficult, if you think about other dual use technologies of the past, think about uh, uh, nuclear science, if I could call it that, you know, huge benefit in terms of, you know, power and energy generation uh, could be used for weapons. The difference with those technologies, if you like, was that uh, with those technologies, they were largely all in the hands mm. of governments. Uh, they were not in the private sector. This set here is. It's, it's in the private sector and it's in governments. In fact, the most advanced versions of them mm. are actually in the private sector much more than in the governments, in the government. So that's one difference. Another difference is that, uh, that you know, it's hard to detect their use. So it's very mm. hard today for anybody to set off a nuclear uh, weapon on anywhere on the planet without anybody knowing. But do we always know when somebody's used AI technology to do something? You know, no. not really. So, the, yeah. so, so it's a much, much more complicated setup. Uh, and I think glo global cooperation on this is going to be so fundamental. The good news is that you are seeing some companies start to create some own, some of their own kind of peer pressure, self-governing mechanisms. So one example of this is the partnership on AI, uh, which you know several companies signed up to a kind of a self-governance set of principles around the use of AI. And I think they now have 800 members, but the founding members were companies like Google and, and Facebook right. and, and, and Microsoft, et cetera. So I think governance mechanisms are gonna have to emerge from somewhere. Well, I think my dinner with Michael and James is going really well, but now we're at the dessert portion and we've got um, a lot of questions from folks. So I'm gonna ask both of you to be as brief as possible so we can cook through some of these. I'm gonna start out of respect for Rob Johnson who built INET. Uh, Rob Johnson asks, um, what social reforms of our governance system do we need to make so that we can incorporate the potential of technology to increase the balance and coherence of society? It's it, it, which I think is when he says, can tech contribute to the integrity of democracy or can democracy mitigate the extremes of inequality that technological change has, has caused? Um, Michael, quick thoughts? I think that properly used technology has um, an important role to play in the inclusiveness agenda. I don't need to repeat it. Um, and I believe that it has an important role to play in data privacy and security. So dealing with that enabling factor and finally, I think that uh, while it's a, a more challenging sort of complicated problem, I think that technology does not, in my view, have to be a negative factor as it appears to be now in much of the sort of uh, political process, uh, a, a kind of negative factor that really worries people. But James? Yeah, I think to the extent that technology is contributing to two things uh, in our social policies, one which is creating prosperity, innovation, and things that are good for society, that's important, but also to the extent that it's also promoting inclusion and inclusivity in the ways that Mike was describing before, then it's a powerful force. Great. Let me take this question uh, and direct it to James real quickly from Jesus Salgado from Universidad Polytechnic. He says, I'd like to know the impressions um, from you about whether AI systems applied to worker management, whether this um, has an impact on workers' health, their physical and psychosocial health, and the safety of workers. Uh, well, I think it certainly has the potential to improve safety, uh, for sure. One of the things that we're seeing, particularly in this COVID moment, by the way, uh, is how AI and machine learning techniques are actually helping us understand the workplace from a safety standpoint much better uh, and anticipate things that can happen in the workplace much better. So that's a good thing. I think where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where it becomes 
more complicated is if we start to then collect a lot of information about workers, uh, then we have to think about, uh, you know, how do we so, so, you know, so, so in, in, enable worker privacy in the workplace if we start to capture a lot of information. I think there's a balance there to be managed. I think on the question of health, uh, it, 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 it actually depends. I mean, it depends if we think about health in the sense of uh, pandemics and kind of infection and so forth, it can absolutely help. I mean, many of the techniques that are being used for contact tracing and so forth actually are using these technologies. But if you think about health in the sense of either attention and you know, mm -hmm. addictive behaviors, then that's a that's a whole different conversation. That's a much longer conversation. Thank you. We'll do that in the next INET show. Michael, um, we have somebody in Italy from the University of Bologna, pa Paolo Onofri, asking interesting yeah. questions. How do you think the transitions mentioned in technology and education are going to combine with the democratic or demographic transition? And if I can just piggyback on his on, on Paolo's very interesting question. Is, do we need to rethink to some degree education in a way? We often, we used to talk about living in a digital world. Now we've all been forced to. We often talk about lifelong education and refreshes and continuing, but we've never really done it, not in the United States. So I'd like to just piggyback on, on Paolo's question. Gosh, I mean, there's, you know, if you think of that as in terms of a model, I mean, there's a lot of variables. So we are aging. Um, and that, and you know, and that has that is a relevant part of the the challenge because an older society that may have to work longer because because we're living longer and we can't afford <laughs> to stop working at fifty anymore. You know, maybe a different maybe a different education and training and reskilling and retraining challenge than than the than the younger population. So so it it it's certainly relevant. Um, I I think there's two things that characterize the American situation relative to what I think of as best practice. One is just, and it's not easy to figure out how to do this, okay? So it's not just money, but you can underfund it. And, you know, there's been articles written about the dramatic difference in the a fraction of GDP devoted to sort of training after you finished your schooling in places like Denmark relative to, to the United States. So we talk a lot and so far, you know, at least on the public sector side, we've done, you know, a little less action rather than talk. Um, but, I, but, I, but I think, you know, the other thing I guess I would say, and James can add to this, is I think digital technology is a really powerful weapon um, across the board with respect to education, training, and skills. And mm -hmm. the, the startups that I'm aware of are across the world, and they're blossoming because of the demands of the pandemic, the mobility restrictions of the pandemic economy, are just accelerating the creation of these, of these vehicles. And I, and I think if we embrace them uh, and use them effectively, they'll make a major dent in the, in the, in the sort of educational training side. Yeah, Thank the, the you. We've other thing I would question. Oh, go ahead, mm -hmm. James. Uh, just a quick, quick add to Mike's comment. I, I think on the education front, one of the things we've seen in the U.S., but in particular <clears> in Europe, because uh, we just did some research on skills in Europe, in particular, and the future of work, is a bit of a mismatch. Which is, if you look at the growth and demand for jobs in Europe, there's a mismatch between what those jobs need and what the training educational systems are delivering. So. Uh, and what, what seems to be most in demand are going to be, be these STEM-based digital skills, but also emotional social skills in, a, in an interesting mm -hmm. way. So it seems to be a combination not just of STEM, but some of these social-emotional skills that seem to be in high demand. So our education systems are going to have to reflect that. And right now, there's a mismatch. Michael, we've got a question from Samyak Jain from Rethinking Economics and says, isn't it better for government to create large numbers of state jobs for people instead of spending money in UBI schemes? Because people don't only need money to survive, but also identity and a sense of fulfillment, which comes from work. Um, I would love your comments on that, but I would you know, say that, that this is one of the comments that Joe Biden has been making about the value uh, of work. And there are people like Ernie Moniz, uh, former energy secretary, about been promoting a kind of WPP-like energy jobs coalition, so that we build out in the next big en energy infrastructure uh, investments of the country around new energy a big jobs program. So, just want to um, add that, Michael, your thoughts? 
Well, very quickly, I think the answer is, or the reaction is positive, provided that you are um, creating jobs that are adding value to the economy. So in an environment where there are obvious areas of underinvestment on the public sector side, it's a, it's a no-brainer. You know, you know, you can up the levels of public sector investment, which involves creating jobs, and you're doing good on two fronts. You're employing people, they're actually contributing to society, and you're increasing the asset base of the economy, so you're improving the future and so on. Um, you know, you've got to afford to be able to do it, so it's a bit of a challenge when you're running up government debt as fast as, as we are. But the caution is, um, it's not better to create jobs that are unproductive just to employ people. You know, we, James and I have both spent a lot of time in developing countries in the fallback position when the private mm -hmm. sector is stuttering in creating jobs is to do it in the government sector. And so I'm, I'm not going to name countries, but I can tell you I've been places where everybody in university is training for a government job because those are the ones everybody wants because they're stable, secure, high paying and so on. And that's that's a prescription for stagnation. Right. So mm -hmm. that, that that's the qualification. There's the if you, if you accept this proviso, do it because it's advancing something in society, then but then it's then it's fine and an important policy tool. And we have two arenas where it would be advancing society. One is climate adaptation. Uh, there's a lot yep. of work to retrofit mm -hmm. our economic systems for, in fact, a more climate resilient future. So that's work that's worth doing. And depending on which yep. country you're in, uh, right. infrastructure, uh, especially if you're in the United States where the infrastructure is terrible. So that's yeah. work that's worth doing. Here's an interesting question from Morris Pearl from Patriotic Millionaires. Morris asked, does this new phenomenon of a tiny number of people generating all of the value in an economy, very different from something like a railroad or an automobile maker or a mine that needs, uh, uh, you know, needs people, does this require a new policy, a new tax policy that results in redistribution? Do you have thoughts on that, James? Uh, no, I, but I think it requires uh, different mechanisms for people to participate, uh, as mm. we've talked about before. Uh, so whether it's different asset ownership or different mechanisms. I think it also requires uh, ways to provide mechanisms for people to sustain themselves. And so that could be... So one of the things we uh, most of our policy systems don't do is we don't... We haven't actually created enough incentives, for example, for companies to train and educate people on the job. Uh, mm. in, we create all kinds of incentives for companies to invest in R&D, we give them R&D tax credits, we run capital. Those are all important and the right things to do. We don't do nearly as much when it comes to human capital and development. So incentives to encourage human capital development are pretty critical. Good. Yep. Let's see here. Um, we have one from... Uh, We've done that topic already. I apologize. Jay Pockington from the new the Institute for New Economic Thinking says, "What is the future of work in the informal sectors in advanced economies as well as developing ones?" Uh, Michael. Um, well, there's a I don't know whether you call it informal because it has a kind of technical meaning in yeah. developing countries. So, sure. And it, it has a, a negative connotation because you're kind of out there on your own without the things. But, but I think if but, but I think we are going to have, you know, a contract gig, you know, big component of the economy and provided it's underpinned with, um, you know, accessible, uh, you know, essentially social insurance, social support mechanisms that are affordable for everybody. So as an inclusive, you know, then I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, it doesn't imply that there's economic insecurity. Um, with the right mechanisms of the type that that James talked about before under the social contract. So, and so I'm 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 not. Um, yes, I think it, we are going to have a big quote informal economy, and if we do things right, it's uh, it may be a net positive in terms of you know flexibility with respect to work and and the way you engage with the economy. A lot of people. We have a couple of questions for for both of you about. You know, I'm going to blur them together, but but somebody's asked, is there a digital economy that can leapfrog traditional economy like bartering? And we've had a number of questions about blockchain and cryptocurrencies uh, and whether transactions in this arena 
uh, restores trust in technology, which is an interesting question, um, and what, how you see these other methods of transactions um, and, and a digital economy coming in to you know, be a high trust um, economy replacing maybe what we have today. I'm sort of blurring them together. Sorry if that's inarticulate. Yeah, well, you, you see both. We, oh, go ahead, James. Go ahead, James. No, no, go, go ahead, Mike. No, I, I was just going to say, if you go to developing countries, you see the leapfrogging phenomenon clear as a bell. I mean, cash to mobile payment mm. systems, you know, with nothing in the middle. Right. And most people, I think, you know, who study these things think, you know, that's one of the reasons we go more slowly in that direction, because we already have reasonably adequate you know, substitutes in the form of, you know, debit cards, credit cards, cash, and, and other things. But I think whether it's a net positive or not depends crucially on what we talked about before. So in China, you know, Alipay, now Ant Financial or Ant Group, was created to solve a trust problem. I think by and large, they have maintained, you know, their reputation for dealing in a trustworthy way. Um, they are going to be regulated by the government, as they should be, with capital requirements, because they may not be just super terrific at assessing financial risk <laughs> as they get into, you know, being a bank or a money market fund or so on. On the other hand, the the peer-to-peer the -peer lending in that context was a disaster, right? I mean, inadequate disclosure, entities that weren't trust didn't turn out to be just basically been shut down. So I think the the answer is. Yes, the potential's there, but it requires, you know, um, alert regulation and highly responsible behavior and integrity on the part of the players who come out being the important players in, in you know, especially the platforms. Thoughts, uh, James? Yeah, I, I would agree with exactly what Michael Mike just described. I think it's correct because I think the the, I think with the, the emergence of barter systems is showing itself up in the growth of things that look like digital marketplaces. Now, some of those are obviously people are transacting in money, but we're going to see many others transacting in other mechanisms of exchange as well. But I think the key is, as Mike said, is about how do we think about building trust and transparency to those systems? Because one of the things that's emerging in marketplaces often mm. is Yes, the challenge of trust, uh, but also just transparency. So it's a classic question of, in a, in a digital market, or any marketplace for that matter, how do I know the supply demand asymmetries are really what they are? Uh, if prices mm. go up, is that really because supply demand asymmetries has really gone up or not? So questions about transparency, questions about trust become really, really important. But there's no question that the arenas where we're going to see these digital marketplaces show up is vast. We've only just scratched the surface of these marketplaces. Look, having having dinner with the two of you in my fantasy dinner here, there was a course that I wanted to have, we'll have to leave till next time, which is to discuss broad implications of China and what's going on on that front, which would have been uh, a lot of fun to do. But I think this has been a superb uh, conversation. We got in a, a really a good number of questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get them uh, to them all, everyone, but I think we did a very good job. Um, I want to uh, uh, tell everyone that that next Tuesday at 12 p.m., uh, that INET will have a forum called What is Technology? Uh, with Long Chen, Anton, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, Kor Koninek, Kornek, and John Van Rienen. If you haven't already registered, you should do that at the right of the INET website. Uh, and you can join that next week at 12 p.m. We also have a Young Scholars Initiative that will be taking place right after this. And if you're part of that group, you can click on the link uh, for that also at the bottom of your screen. But I just want to give a big thanks to Michael Spence and to James Manika for a superb conversation covering a lot of ground and territory. Um, so thank you both.